Heavenly Father, let us proclaim peace wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are only a few notable exceptions between last night and this morning. No, you, if you were here, could still smell a little bit of the candle smoke. You would find the melted wax on the floor and some of the pews, smashed cookies in the carpet out in the narthex. Um, and to be honest, we're all a little more tired. The decorations and flowers and trees and garland and banners, all the same. There are, though, three notable exceptions. Jesus is in the manger. We don't allow him in there until midnight and one second. And it's the same with the Christ candle. We don't light the Christ candle until one second after midnight. And uh, we don't need the candles as much today for light. Um, we're getting both the light of the sun, S-U-N, as well as the light of the sun, S-O-N. I mentioned last night the Christmas Eve, at least as we know it, the worship services are relatively recent, only about the last 100 years. Once upon a time, Christmas Day worship would have been packed. Today, most people prefer the evening services. At times changes things, and rather than mourn over what was lost or changed, it's far healthier to view these moments with an open mind and an open soul. For while we may be surprised at the changes in the world, God is not. And so when St. Paul says all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, it still may not be comfortable, but we know that God will work it all out. Now God speaks to us in and through our lives. And the truth is, even if we hear what God is saying and acknowledge that it's God who's speaking, it often takes years and sometimes some pretty hard knocks before we glimpse what it is that God is actually trying to say to us. And even then, it is not until we have no more choices and no more options that we find ourselves embracing it. Until then, we glimpse it as dimly as the worship folder last night in the candlelight, which for those of us who are growing a little older, we had to hold further and further away. But then it was darker and darker, and so we found ourselves doing this. And that is why today, with more than enough light, we are reminded that God is with us. In fact, he's always been with us, and he will always be with us. Because the world changed, our worship today is quieter and smaller. And even though there are fewer voices this year, some because of the pandemic and others because there was a huge change that took place after the pandemic when it came to people and worship attendance, see, some... Some of our folks are worshiping with the angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven. Others are worshiping in Germany and New Zealand and Tokyo and Minnesota and California today. And still others who just couldn't drag themselves out of bed this morning. And it doesn't change the truth of who and what we have come to celebrate. And we can be sure that God is not just inside these walls. He is with all of our friends and all of our family no matter where they are and no matter why, they are there. There is something about Christmas worship in Hawaii. I mean, everybody else is excited about the shortest day of the year. Uh, the, that being behind them and, and winter it may have arrived, but they say, ooh, I can almost see and smell spring is coming. For us, unless you're lamenting the fact that last week we hit 67 degrees. I had to get jackets out. I had to get a blanket to put on the bed. I know, I'm not complaining because... Would, you'd just call me a sissy, and I am. Or the fact that we only have 11 hours of daylight. There is a marked difference, though, between Christmas here and Christmas in most of the mainland. Christmas has become a peculiar thing. I mean, it's religious. It's cross-cultural. It's also secular depending on how you choose to celebrate it. And yet, with the exception of a few pre-roast beast Grinches and unconverted Scrooges, almost everyone runs around celebrating their version of Christmas alongside everyone else who is celebrating their own version of Christmas. The church long ago tried to figure out how to exist alongside all the not-Christian celebrations, especially during the times of persecution and great division. The Christian faith has always been about living with one foot in heaven and one foot still in this world. And perhaps that is one of the greatest gifts of Christmas. It gives us an opportunity to find out what the rest of the world is thinking, what their needs are, what their desires are, which, by the way, are all reflected in how they celebrate 
their version of Christmas. You see, when you see how everything is marketed, and you see what people are running for, and, and all the things that become popular, you begin to get an idea what the world thinks they need. The church long ago, like I said, tried to figure out how to exist alongside not Christian celebrations. And today, we're caught in this tension. Now, the story told in the Bible, though, is pretty clear. And it doesn't start with Matthew 1, John 1, or Luke 2. It starts with Genesis 3.15, where God promises a Savior. Now, at Christmas, those of us who are church celebrate a birth that brings light into the darkness, hope into our lives, and a reason to get up in the morning and keep getting up every morning until the day that we wake up in heaven. God was active in history long before Jesus got born. And part of the Christmas mystery is connecting all of those moments in time into one big, beautiful picture. So Matthew starts his gospel, the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I read it just a few minutes ago. If you fell asleep, you can rewind and watch it again. Luke starts his gospel. Well, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Obviously, Theophilus is in confirmation class. Mark doesn't bother with the birth narrative. He jumps right into, well, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then he goes straight to Jesus' baptism and John the baptizer. John, ever the poet and deep thinker begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things that were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created, and life was in him, and that life was the light of all people, and that light shines in the darkness. Yet the darkness could not and will not and never will overcome it. Each gospel was written intentionally and specifically, knowing that there would be all kinds of people down through the centuries who would ask all sorts of questions about God and about His Son and about Christmas and about, well, the Virgin Mary and the shepherds and the wise men and, you know, about getting lost and found. See, when St. John starts off in the beginning, they echo the first words from the book of Genesis. And this huge arc is drawn through time and space between the birth of creation and the birth of Jesus. Matthew lines everything up for those who like to dot their I's and cross their T's and put commas everywhere they belong. Luke spends his time on the human details of shepherds in a manger and Mary and Joseph and there not being any room in the inn. John, yep, mystery and majesty. Luke's words are a quiet story of a holy family. Matthew's a history lesson. John, a poetic mystery. I would love to take a poll this morning, ask which gospel is your favorite. By doing so, by the way, I would actually learn a little bit about you, who you are, the kind of person you are. Do you prefer spending your time in the cosmos, contemplating the stars and the word that created all of it? Would you rather muck around in the hay and the donkey poo and hold the baby Jesus? Or would you rather make sure that there's actually 14 generations and 14 generations and 14 generations? And I'm going to give you a clue. One of them actually only has 13, but there's a secret to that. Before I make it sound like John didn't get the whole reason for Jesus getting born, well, that actually couldn't be further from the truth. Leave it to a poet and a mystic to find a way to connect the universe to a stable in Bethlehem. Connect God, you know, who created all things, to His creation, meaning us. Just as we are comfortable floating around in the heavens, hearing angel choirs and watching galaxies explode into existence and light bursting forth and shattering the darkness as John just waxes poetically, we're brought back to earth with the cry of a baby. And John says the word, the same word that spoke and created all things, it became flesh and dwells among us. Wow. There is no poetry ever written that was able to stop us in our tracks the way those words do. Takes our breath away, widens our eyes, because God just became very, very real. And the whole thing got very, very personal. There's a reason it's very, very personal. The darkness invades each of our lives in different ways. 
Knowing the genealogy of Jesus is important. Following the prophet's trail of breadcrumbs through the centuries allows us to know that Jesus really is the one that we have been waiting for. The story of Mary and Joseph and their highs and lows and a birth taking place in a stable and the Lord of Lords and King of Kings finding his first bed in a dirty hay and manger with nobody but stinky shepherds in attendance. Well, even Hallmark couldn't tug heartstrings like that story. Mark skipping the whole thing? I get it. Because while even the church tends to make the biggest deal and finds its highest attendances between Jesus' birth and Jesus' resurrection, there's always a lot more about Jesus' story than just those two. And Mark, Mark does a great job of pointing that out. Remember his favorite word? Immediately. Until I get to heaven and get to ask him, I'll never know exactly why St. John was trying to do what he did when he wrote the first words of his gospel, other than remaining true to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I do know that John, out of all the gospels, gives us cause for reflection, to say lie, as King David would say. Not simply because God showed up in the middle of our world, but because God entered our world as one of us, fragile, needy, and at times lost and hungry and living among such brokenness that it was heartbreaking. If this were your very first Christmas, you had never, ever, ever heard the Christmas story before. While all the theological language and metaphors and innuendos might confuse you, and some things like the virgin birth and the angels and the evil kings and the magi might cause you to, to doubt just for a minute and say, come on, is that really a true story? I'm pretty sure when we read John's gospel and the whole the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot and will not nor will it ever overcome it, that you would understand. Light moving into darkness, which then is no longer dark. Light, which brings a chance to see things as they really are. Light that we, well, it might create some shadows, but it also illuminates everything around us so that we no longer need to be afraid. We no longer need a night light because we have a bigger light. Light that remains and reminds us that a new day brings a chance to fix anything and everything that we might have broken yesterday. All of us live in different darknesses, the darkness of mental illness for a friend or loved one, maybe even us, the darkness of grief over the loss of a loved one who meant the world to us, and well, there's an empty chair at the table, and every time we pick up the phone to call them, we realize they're not going to answer, the darkness of disease and growing old and the pains of life that afflict us and just sometimes keep getting worse. The darkness of a world that's being torn apart by war and famine and drought and egos. A darkness that invades relationships and families and splinters them. If we sat and talked about the darkness, each of us could give a name to our particular darkness. And in our naming, we discover an important truth. The act of naming something is an act of power over whatever it is that we are naming. And yet, it's not enough just to name it. There must be a reason, a rationale, a truth to us being able to name it. And that reason is that it no longer has power over us. And that's why this day is so important, even for those and perhaps especially for those who aren't the least bit interested in a child or shepherds or angels or a stable in Bethlehem. Into the darkness, not just any darkness, but our darkness. Jesus got born. And it wasn't just a flash of light or moment of hope, but a light that shines. And by the way, it continues to shine, pushing back the darkness further and further until the book of Revelation says there will no longer be a darkness. And no matter how hard the darkness tries, it can no longer envelop those who are bathed in the glow of Jesus' light. You see, Jesus is the light. That's capital T, capital H, capital E. A burst of defiant hope as he calls anyone and everyone to follow the light to the source where they will discover a truth that allows them to name their darkness and their fears and their doubts and their failures and their sins because of what he has done, they no longer have power over those who believe in him. We don't have to go very far to find what's broken. It doesn't take much imagination to look out the window and see darkness. But think about how fast light travels. One second, actually one millisecond, you are in the darkness and then someone flips the light switch and you are bathed in light. 
We step out of our homes and into the brilliant rays of the sun. We tap our watch. We yell at Alexa or flip the switch on a flashlight. And what was dark is no longer dark. And it happens so quickly that, to be honest, our, lie, our eyes have a problem adjusting that quickly. We make a big deal out of Christmas, and we should. But to be theologically correct, Jesus may have gotten born on Christmas, but he entered our world nine months earlier. And if we want to be picky, he was the one who called all things into being. And there is nothing in the Bible to ever suggest that he ever left us after he called everything into being. Oh, he took on flesh and got all balled up inside of Mary, but there's never been a time when Jesus wasn't walking beside you or me. So Merry Christmas. You see, the writers of the Gospels wanted to make sure that no matter who you are or what you're dealing with or what came up yesterday or what's going to come up tomorrow, you know that you are loved and forgiven, that you are watched over by God, a God, by the way, who will do anything for you because you are His unique and unreproducible miracles. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not, cannot, nor will it ever overcome it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Meli Kaliki Maka, God is your light. Take that one and run through the neighborhood, because the darkness in the neighborhood could probably use a little push back and follow Jesus. Amen.